Well, thanks again to Arknet. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, it, it is a real pleasure to uh, be able to speak to you. I think uh, one of the things that we don't often do uh, enough is actually reflect on what we do. Uh, as uh, as Mohammed kindly introduced, I, I'm the Head of Master Planning uh, for the Middle East and Africa for ACOM. I'm based in Dubai. Um, and we, our folk practice here is really focusing uh, on sustainable and resilient cities. And there is a real urgency that, for that. There's a need for that that is, is at the core of a, a lot of what I'm going to show you tonight. Um, I have practice across, uh, originally from Australia, practice in uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia for 10 years and uh, have spent the last uh, 12 years here in Dubai, um, essentially working uh, working here because of the incredible opportunity that we have. Um, and we, we really do have um, uh, th this sort of incredible combination of enormous uh, projects, um, uh, power to make decisions holistically, uh, and, and the financial means to, to really do amazing things. Um, and that's what's kept me here for so long. It really is something that um, I think is a unique combination everywhere in the world. And I think those of you out there, especially the young professionals, you've got an incredible opportunity, but that's also a responsibility. And that's really the topic I want to talk, uh, what I want to talk about tonight. Um, the, 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 the title of this uh, is a little bit dramatic. You know, 10 years left to save the earth, but there is a reason, uh, and I'll run you through uh, that. I think that um, climate change is not a surprise to any of you. Uh, we all know that, that it's a reality, that, that uh, science is, is telling us it's urgent. Um, uh, and this, there were sort of headlines uh, a couple of years ago uh, when the IPCC released uh, it, its latest report in 2018 uh, about uh, us having tw essentially uh, 10 years left to limit climate change. Um, th there was an interesting line in that that really affected me and, and what I uh, what I basically do. And it was that we were at this point was a line in the sand. Uh, and it, it, for our species, it's a, it's a moment where we must act now. Um, this idea of the clarion bell from science to mobilize people like us, to mobilize uh, designers who are actually making places. And there, there is a significant reason for that. We are responsible for the vast majority of, uh, of our um, uh, carbon emissions. Um, at that time, um, what, what, and this is from the IPCC's report at the time, they were mapping uh, surface temperature rise. And as you, most of you are probably aware, we're trying to keep uh, surface temperature rises um, below 1.5 degrees. Now, um, what, what that is, is essentially we're at this point now by 2030, where we're going to get to that point. Um, and if we don't act immediately, um, we we will probably uh, exceed that that, uh, that point, and that's what we've got to really focus on as designers. I think um, there is real and immediate impact for us. Um, there, uh, climate change probably in in the Gulf um, is most directly exp exp expressed um, through uh, a heating climate. Um, and our, you know we have current summers where you'll get you know the days that that hit 55 degrees. Um, what this uh, what what this sort of Gulf news story was was talking about if we don't act, uh, the Gulf may be too hot for humans to survive outdoors uh, by 2070. Um, and again, it, it may seem uh, may seem like it's quite dramatic, but um, the science is telling us that if we look at the various uh, scenarios that the IPCC has modelled. Uh, you can see this is this is a prediction for Dubai, where if we if we don't act, if we keep growing as we have been, average temperatures could grow by 5.4 degrees uh, in the next uh, next half a century. Now, what that effectively means is that that you know we would be having temperatures well over 60 degrees centigrade um, for uh, for summits. Uh, it would simply be intolerable. Uh, we would be at a point where we could no longer live in this region. Um, but uh, that has also other flow-on effects. Um, that heat will obviously lead to things like sea level rise. And what you see here uh, is a simulation that, that uh, looks at 
uh, one of the one of the IPCC uh, scenarios, which was for about seven meters sea level rise in the long term, um, and this is showing you Dubai. I mean, to zoom in slightly, you'll see that the, probably the vast majority, perhaps two thirds of Dubai, Dubai's existing urban fabric, uh, would be um, would be destroyed. Uh, would be underwater, um, and that is, uh, you know, that while that's a long-term projection, it's something we we just cannot ignore. Um, so that a lot of that is quite negative and and very concerning, um, but I think we also have have reasons for hope, and a couple of things have have sort of inspired me in the last few years. Uh, one of which has been um, some work done by the University of Pennsylvania and Richard Weller, um, who's a former mentor of mine. Um, he He's authored a couple of documents. Um, one is called The Atlas for the End of the World that simply mapped all of the uh, biodiversity zones of the world and the fastest growing cities of the world. And you see on the map on the left-hand side here, those two, those two categories are crashing together. Uh, and the places where we most want to preserve biodiversity um, are the ones that are actually most likely to uh, to actually clash with urban development. Um, what they what they've since done is the Atlas for the New Green Deal, which looked at can we combine or can we come up with a scenario that combines the um, preservation of biodiversity, uh, increasing population in America, and also. Um, do it in a way where we uh, we essentially have a net positive outcome for the environment. Um, now, I think that that's a kind of data scaping exercise that really starts to show the way that we need to look at everything we do. Um, and we do have to take the, the responsibility for that and to really start to think about ourselves as the people who have to deliver this every day. Um, Oops, sorry. Um, another thing that, that very much inspired me in the last few years uh, was a book by Muhammad Yunus, who, who came up with the concept of microfinance and, and really transformed the social life uh, and social equity uh, in places like Bangladesh through the Grameen Bank. Um, and his book, The World of Three Zeros, really took a very simple idea. That was the idea that we could achieve zero poverty zero unemployment and zero net carbon emissions. Um, and he talks about in the book, Pathways to Achieve That. Um, now, we all know that that such simple ideas are, are you know, obviously what we should be aiming for, but they're incredibly difficult to do. Um, but those few things sort of led me to a place where um, conceptually then we knew that the work that we need to do, and we obviously work on large scale master plans most of the time, had to embody these, these ideas, had to uh, respond in some way. Um, and what I wanna do is sort of show you through some of the work we've been doing uh, and some of the approaches that we have um, to, to give you our take, our, our sort of response to how we think um, that should be interpreted. Now, um, my background is, is both in urban planning uh, and landscape architecture. Um, and so I've often combined those two things and I'm very strongly believing the idea of, of what I call cyborg landscapes or new natures, where very little of the earth is, is untouched by human hand anymore. Uh, arguably none of it uh, is untouched by human hand. So we have to embrace this idea of making new natures. Um, the, the, the problems that we're facing as professionals, the, um, the way that we are being uh, tasked with uh, addressing these problems in the next 10 years are massively complex. Um, they're in, in science or mathematical terms, uh, something that would be regarded as a wicked problem, something that's almost unsolvable. So how do we approach them? Um, and for me, again, the, the, the sort of approach is, is relatively clear. Um, for me, the landscape is the medium through which all ecological transactions pass. So that's got to be the way that we look at things. We stop looking at cities as one thing and landscapes as another thing and really look at them uh, as one and the same thing that um, our cities are just simply human ecologies uh, that um, if we start seeing cities as metabolic systems themselves uh, and we start um, designing synthetic ecologies, we'll start to actually transform these environments. Um, 
and this, while I, while I talk about this in relation to the sort of knowledge on climate change, this has been something that we've been playing with for a while. Um, not long after I first arrived in Dubai, um, we, we worked on a, a speculative project and, and this was sort of at the time that the global financial crisis was really starting to take hold. Um, and so we took the time to, to speculate on what would it be, what would it mean um, to be self-sufficient in the arid uh, subtropics of the Gulf? Um, and we did a, a sort of thought exercise for uh, a, a free zone that had been announced at the time called Food City in Dubai. This wasn't a commission project, it was just a, an exploration, a thought piece that we sort of started testing some ideas um, where we tried to figure out, is it possible to be self-sufficient? If, if it is, what do we need to do to be self-sufficient? Um, and this was sort of very much focused on the idea of a, um, a, a self-sufficiency in terms of energy, uh, in terms of water and the, the way we recycle water, and in terms of materials. So that could be food, building materials, waste, anything that, that was coming out of this. So this was designed as a, as a community, self-sufficient community for 50,000 people. Um, uh, and it sort of got to the point of catering for its own needs. Um, and this was something that, that really inspired a lot of the approaches to this sense of synthetic ecologies and how we could sort of make places that uh, are really starting to address the things that we need to do. And, and there was an increased uh, perspective at those times on sustainability. Um, and in a way, uh, I think that uh, if we accept that, that the entire earth is a me metabolic system, how does that change our roles as designers? How does it, how does it, um, what, how should we look at the way that we create places? Now, this is kind of a joke in a way, but it, it does embody some of the ideas that, that we, we sort of believe in. This, this idea of cyborg landscapes, uh, uh, sort of this marriage of um, uh, uh, sort of technology and biology. Uh, and we have to see ourselves as sort of the, the doctor who's nursing nursing that thing to life, that we have to we have to basically uh, we've created uh, in a way in in our current environments um, that that situation that cyber existence, and we have to actually manage that and we have to actually actively engage in it. I don't think it is realistic to, for us to think that we can go back anymore. Um, and there there is signs that we're actually doing this already. Um, this this was a story that I came across several years ago, um, and it, it's a, it's about some really um, surprising and interesting work that has happened in the Gulf, um, in the rest of the world, pretty much everywhere else in the world. Um, cities are heat islands, and is well known through the idea of urban heat islands. In the Gulf, um, the cities of the Gulf, uh, and it's not just Dubai or Doha which are mentioned here but actually throughout the cities of the Gulf, our cities are actually cooler than the areas outside the city. Um, so in, in Doha, it's on average six degrees cooler. In Dubai, it's up to 10 degrees cooler during the summer. Um, and, and that is really, uh, it shows that we can geoengineer our cities, that we can modify things and actually uh, sort of proactively respond and create things that address um, address climate change, not by going back to a pre-existing natural condition, but by creating a new nature. Now, in the Gulf, that's happened because of the way we've green cities. So the, the, the guys who studied this, uh, this effect uh, were at Mazdar Institute, and they correlated the exact, uh, the exact impact with the increasing vegetation in cities. So, um, as temperatures reduced in cities, vegetation increased, and they found the correlation there and through sort of satellite imagery over time. So I think it's important to know that we can change these things, and we are, we are changing these things. Um, so whether or like it, and whether or not we like it, um, we're responsible for planning resilient and responsible design that really deals with climate change. Um, that has to be our role. Um, and I, I sort of refer to Donna Haraway's work. She, she's actually um, a sociologist that, that talks about um, the world as a cyborg. 
and, and I'm really struck by the way she talks about nature and culture and how they're reworked. And one is no longer a resource for the other. That means cities are no longer divorced from the landscapes in which they sit. They're not there to consume the resources that the landscape can provide. So um, in a sense, and again, this, this sort of comes back to the idea of like Frankenstein's monster, the cyborg doesn't expect to be saved through a restoration of the garden. Um, I think that's a topic that has been debated a lot, uh, particularly in landscape architecture theory of, should we be aiming to get all of uh, our landscapes back to a pre-existing condition? And th there is a sort of strong preservation story and there's also a strong, we're too, too far beyond that. And, and I, I guess I fall on the side of, I think we're too far beyond uh, restoring a natural condition. We need to actually look at the earth uh, as a kind of cyborg uh, uh, itself that combines the technologi technological aspects of our cities and the biological aspects of our landscapes. Um, and so I think what has happened in a lot of urbanism theory um, has been around that in some way. Um, in some ways, nature and culture are increasingly indistinguishable. Um, we, we have to sort of start seeing urbanism as restorative. And if you look at um, urban projects like the High Line in New York, they're, they're really starting to address new types of nature. Um, but we've got to, to do that, we've got to be intentionally willing to change the host ecosystems that are there. Not, not to try to get back to what it was, but to really change, to, to add biocapacity. Um, the, the, and uh, I think the other correlation to that in terms of how we do it is technology. Technology has to enable that process and we have to use the tools that we've got to kind of enable that. Um, and and the, the use of digital tools in particular is something that um, I, we've sort of been looking at lately. Um, and it was a subject of, uh, of a uh, paper I presented recently at the Digital Landscape Architecture Conference. Uh, I'm not going to go through this list, but this is sort of picking up some of the key type of, types of software that we use. Um, and it does pick up sort of thing, things from uh, GIS to parametric modeling to sort of big data. All of these tools are helping us do these incredible uh, sort of things, uh, the, these uh, ways to create uh, new places that are um, so complex that we could never have imagined it before. But the problem that we have with them is that most of them don't work well with one another. Um, they're mostly proprietary, they don't interoperate, uh, but they're really evolving fast. And we see now with things like Rhino in Revit, um, that software is starting to become more interactive. And for us to really be successful, I think we're going to need to do that. If we continue to use tools, one tool to do a job, another tool to do another job, when they don't talk well with one another, that's ultimately um, not going to work for us. So um, these things all came together for us in a few projects. And I'm going to run you through a few projects that are kind of like a transect that led to this idea that I've talked about, which is called plus urbanism. And that's really creating landscapes that produce more than they consume. So if we make a city landscape, we don't just provide for the, the energy, the water, the, the food that those people need, but, but more than that. Um, we provide more biodiversity than there was there before. Um, it was really, it, it's really a continuation uh, of the things that, um, that, that people like Richard Weller and Mohammed Yunus have talked about, very simply defined goals where you're either producing more than you need or you're not, but they're incredibly complex to achieve. Um, how, and for, for us, it's how can we go beyond zero? Um, and in the uh, New Green Deal uh, study that, that Richard Weller uh, uh, sort of directed, he said this, and I think this is really important for young professionals to sort of think about. This is our chance to go fast, think big, and transform the structures that gave us climate change and inequality. Um, to imagine a world uh, in which things are better than we think. And I think that that's embedded in this. If you want, if you want to really change things, you have to believe it's possible. Um, 
And I think these these are projects that I'm about to show you were not projects that started off um, with an intent to to do something uh, that really was a response to climate change, but they were just an attempt to uh, basically do the do what we could with new tools that were evolving. Um, this first one was a project uh, I, I worked on while at Perkins and Will a few years ago in 2015 with a very small team um, that basically was, uh, uh, a, it, we were approached by the mayor of Antalya, which is a city in southern Turkey, and he said, I want to put a marina in the mouth of this river. And we sort of looked at it and realised that this was really not a great idea. But we sort of took it on uh, as a quick study and we had two months to sort of look at this and try and figure out um, can can we make it work. Um, when we were given the, the task, uh, we were told, I want to put a, uh, a, a marina in this river mouth. Oh, but it floods uh, drastically every year. Uh, and you can sort of see why. The, the, the background of the city, tall mountains that have snow every winter, spring comes, snow melts, the whole place floods. So um, really that was the genesis of the way we approached this plan. We were given nothing to start with. We extracted all of our information from Google Earth and used Rhino and Grasshopper scripts to um, explore this. But pretty much the first thing we did was say, you can't look at this as just an exercise to create a project in the mouth of the river. Um, we zoomed out from that project to a 900 square kilometer area. That was the entire watershed. Um, and there was a good reason for that. This creek that the project was based on um, was basically uh, uh, the only water supply for the city. Uh, it had seawater encroaching into that uh, water supply. Uh, it had uh, lots of development happening around it and the city was projected to double in the next 20 years in population. And so we looked at it as this is, this is a whole city issue. Um, and if you want to address things like how we can attract different kinds of tourism here, um, then we need to look at it on the basis of the whole city. Uh, and to, before this, all tourism in the city was um, what the mayor called uh, five-star prisons. And what he meant by saying that was that people would fly into Antalya, would drive straight to the resort, and they would never leave the walls of the resort. So we were looking at this as a kind of um, a way to diversify the economy as well. And if you look at what's happening in the kingdom at the moment, um, th this, is a, this is a story that's being played out across the kingdom of how do we diversify um, uh, tourism. Um, we decided to, to uh, we, with the client's agreement, we decided to zoom out and say, you need a system that addresses the whole watershed before you start thinking about a, a small project. And so we went on, a, on a, uh, a kind of process that we extracted topography from Google Earth. And with that 3D topography, um, the first thing we did was actually model water flow. Um, and we used a scripting approach to, to show where will water fall, how much will it fall, where are the convergences in the water system, and how can we actually use those? The second thing we did was look at the agricultural fields, and there was historic orange groves in this area that have been uh, that have been there for uh, for literally hundreds of years, and so we wanted to protect those agricultural areas, um, and so we mapped the field boundaries and sort of looked at the connection between the water boundaries and the and the field boundaries, and they they showed us a kind of geometric network. Um, it was only then that we started looking at what had been built. And so we mapped the existing uh, buildings and sort of by the coast, the sort of brown buildings, you could see that there was, um, there was a lot of the uh, sort of formal development. In the agricultural areas, there was a whole lot of informal development. Uh, a lot that had been built by refugees that had come into the, the country uh, and were living with virtually no, no services. So we mapped the buildings, then looked at things like the road networks. Um, and so we used a, a sort of uh, a shortest path uh, and maximum benefit uh, uh, sort of scripting exercise to say, where do we get the most benefit from creating connections, new roads, bridges, that sort of thing across this area? Um, and, and that, when we brought that all together, 
that gave us a, a couple of environmental loops that if, if plots touch that loop, uh, they could be developed as a parcel. And we saw this being something that was the basis of an urban planning system for the whole city. Um, and from that, we wanted to test, well, what, what can this create for the city? And so what it did was uh, uh, we, we generated um, uh, 45 development projects um, and uh, 12 infrastructure projects out of this to start to show what the development could be in this way that sort of also did things like protect the city from sea level rise through a tidal barrier at the river mouth, uh, delivered things like a, a, a diversified tourism, either in the form of a, a marina in the river mouth or mountain uh, accommodation or wetlands restoration and, and rewilding or agro-tourism. Um, and then uh, we essentially sort of did a few of those projects to show the potentials of them. Uh, and of course, one of those was the way that we uh, created the marina uh, and, and the development around it. Um, overall, we, we sort of came up with a plan that delivered 6 million square metres of GFA uh, and actually gave a net uh, improvement to uh, potable water supply, protection from sea level rise, uh, uh, protected the agricultural lands uh, and uh, and quite simply improved the quality of water flowing into the creek. Um, a central part of that for us was actually how do we, because the city had turned its back on this creek, um, because it was flooding, because it wasn't usable, uh, the, the, the back of the city faced this creek and we wanted this to be the, the, the thing that stitched the city together. Um, so from a, a simple idea with with some a relatively small team in a short period of time, we, we managed to come up with a system that um, became the basis of an urban planning system for the whole city. And the first project um, we were commissioned to then develop, which was the marina and the surroundings, and that's currently being developed. Um, the next project I wanna show you is, is a very different typology, but, but similar approaches. Um, we had a client who was actually a collaborator, uh, the client was an architect in uh, in Oman, in Muscat, um, that uh, had a piece of land that had, he'd had for 10 years. It was on the mountains above Muscat, um, and he he was convinced that it was it was an incredible opportunity. Uh, and um, so he gave us a, a lot of freedom to really uh, come up with a quick master plan that basically identified what we could do with this. Uh, so it was an 80 square kilometer area. He fully supported us uh, with the ideas of um, making it energy self-sufficient uh, to treat all wastewater on site, to make it self-sufficient in terms of food. Um, and uh, and again, we, we just used tools like Google Earth and Rhino and Grasshopper to do a lot of this work. Um, the, the first task here was topography. And I mean, I think the, the, the that was probably the biggest challenge. And so very small portions of the site were suitable for development. Um, and so we, through a process of subtraction, we kind of found the areas that had gradients that we could work with. Um, and again, um, water became a sort of fundamentally important thing. And many of you who've been to Muscat will know that the wadis that cut through the city um, can be uh, quite violent in terms of when they do have uh, rainstorms. So we had to actually understand the way water moved across this site and let that shape development. Um, at the same time, we were using tools like uh, like uh, grasshopper scripts to do things like tell us where we can get a walkable hiking path, tell us where we can get a road that uh, can achieve a, a maximum 10 degree slope to get us up to these hills from the existing road network. Um, and then sort of also uh, lay it into that, uh, things like um, how we could uh, treat wastewater on site, do we have enough area? Um, and that, what, what would that water system lead to? Now, uh, for us, we, we uh, fashioned a water system around that, that that led to a dam at the lowest point of the site that also was an opportunity for hydroelectricity, but also benefited the developments downstream. So there was a lot of existing urban development downstream that would be affected when the wadis would flood. So we turned this into an opportunity to generate energy, uh, to contain all water on the site and to recycle wastewater on the site through reed bed systems. Um, and again, we, we, what, you, what you sort of see as a practice is that the, these, are, these are sort of the land itself 
telling us uh, what we need to do in terms of creating sustainable developments uh, that uh, that can basically um, uh, coexist or, or at least enhance an environment. Um, and for us, that, that's become a sort of really fundamental starting point that we have to always set out that how do we improve conditions on its own. Um, uh, I want to show that this also works in different places uh, and from sort of the arid zones. We, we once were, we worked in 2016 on a, on a site in the tropics in, in the Maldives. And this was a really unusual uh, situation. The client came to us and said, yeah, we want a quick master plan to sort of figure out what we can do with this, uh, this island. Oh, by the way, all of it's one meter below sea level at the moment. So there, there wasn't an island. We had to create the islands. Um, so uh, we basically uh, looked at this from a from a perspective of a resort island, how we deal with those sort of situations in terms of sustainability, uh, and how uh, we can make this more sustainable. Also, in terms of cost, how can we actually make this work better? than other projects in the Maldives. Because at that time, most islands in the Maldives uh, simply use diesel generators to generate energy. Uh, they use sort of uh, mechanical equipment to treat water and desalinate water and they're, they're pretty inefficient. Um, and, and so we were dealing with a site that's already one meters below sea level that, uh, that needed to actually be created. Um, uh, and then uh, how do we make it more sustainable? Um, and again, this was one where we really questioned ourselves, do we really want to do this? This seems irresponsible. Um, and the challenge is often to turn it into something that, that's responsible. And so we again zoomed out and looked at where it sits in relation to, to the Maldives and the, the atolls there. Um, we were really fortunate in that this, this was, uh, um, we had the information we needed to demonstrate that this atoll had currents that flowed through there that, that created very unique conditions. Um, and so the weathering and the currents created an environment where we could shape um, things like tides and how they could actually be used for the island development. So those, those wind conditions and the tides that come with it um, became a really fundamental part of what we were doing. The first thing we did was look at um, the, the reclamation of the island and the, the developer had uh, a, an initial idea of how they could reclaim land. And using the same amount of uh, of uh, material, so they were essentially pumping up sand uh, and piling it up to create uh, developable land. Um, but what they were doing, they only really created about six and a half kilometres of uh, beachfront in their model. What we had done through using a delta model, uh, so like river deltas, a landscape that, that sort of responds to water flowing through it, um, we managed to create uh, eighteen linear kilometres of, of waterfront where you could have more private uh, beaches uh, for people. Um, and so that was sort of just looking at, again, how can we do this, do better with the same resources? Uh, it really created an incredible opportunity for us because of the, the, uh, the way that um, tides move through this site to create pinch points. And these whites, the white dots that you're seeing at the moment uh, were places where we knew we could put underwater tidal turbines to generate energy. Um, and so that became uh, sort of the, the fundamental uh, uh, start point for the project. Um, we, we basically had something that we knew would work for hospitality, that uh, we knew could actually provide all of the energy on site in a much cheaper way than simply doing diesel generators, obviously a much more sustainable way. Um, and also we, we had the, the publicly available information on the currents that gave us the information we needed to sh be sure that it worked. But we did also want to think about what would be the long-term uh, way that we protect this place. Um, and we looked at natural systems like coral reefs. Uh, coral reefs and mangroves uh, as a natural system uh, do an incredible amount of work over long periods of time to first of all reduce wave action and to actually naturally build up land levels. So we looked at a combination of artificial reefs uh, and mangroves on these sites that would actually help to protect it against future sea level rise. 
Um, and that became uh, part of a water cycle. Uh, so we looked at both the way that we would uh, take uh, energy from tidal water, but also how we could feed into that. Things like uh, grey water and black water that we treat in the landscape of the island uh, and we use to irrigate that island. So um, this, this was looked at as a way that we could basically create a circular economy in, in terms of things like energy and water. Um, and, and sort of energy was supplemented by things like uh, solar, solar collection on buildings. Um, the landscape of the hotel itself was clearly, it was designed to be a resort landscape. So it had to look great. Um, but it also had to do other things because of the way we'd set up the island. And so we had these sort of water feature ponds that were actually cleansing biotopes. They were planted uh, with aquatic plants of the tropics that essentially cleaned the water. So with a combination of reed beds and aquatic systems, we could recycle all water on site. But this became, uh, had to be dressed uh, as any other luxury resort would have to be. Uh, and so we created a sort of series of islets that um, that created, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, this idea of hedonistic sustainability. Sustainability that just it looks like luxury as well. Um, and, and so the, the ponds that we used for cleansing biotopes had to look uh, like they were part of a hospitality landscape. Um, I think one of the great things that came out of uh, clever ways to use reclamation was how we managed to uh, array uh, villas so that every single uh, villa on the on the project either had a private beach or was an over water villa. Um, the over water villas we made uh, floating structures so that uh, if there was sea level rise that they would wouldn't be uh, affected um, by that they would adapt to it. Um, and similarly, the sort of landscape systems in the inner lagoon were aimed at how we could. Uh, create natural forms of protection. Um, so uh, in a way, we sort of zoomed down into this to say, well, this is how we create, a, say, 20 to 40 metres of private beach for every single uh, single pillar. And we looked at those typologies, what sort of energy consumption they would create and how we actually recover that energy. Um, but again, the focus was on making sure we were giving uh, people what they expect out of Maldives Island experience. Um, we also looked at other typologies, uh, and this was sort of uh, one of the one of the overwater typologies, where it was larger uh, and more expensive, notionally uh, kind of villas that um, existed in a way um, that was sort of uh, symbiotic with the water. So the the structures underneath these buildings actually became uh, oyster reefs and and breeding fish breeding areas. Um, and we also uh, looked at a few options for the most exclusive zones that were fully floating, that were well off in the lagoon. So they were the most private, they could only be approached by boat, uh, and they would be uh, they would have a butler service. So I think um, what we were trying to make sure is that we could demonstrate that, that um, sustainability and hospitality go together perfectly well. Um, there is not a typology that, that is not that we do, and there's not a project that's not suitable for these kinds of approaches. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Uh, um, we, I already sent to everyone that we want to send their questions. We, we have still about, uh, we can give about 10 minutes. We have a question from Safa. How can we use the fractals theory to create the natural urban growth of the city instead of imposing the geometry or artificial intervention of the, on the city? Yeah, look, I think fractal geometry is another example of something that we've observed in nature that we don't uh, use well enough. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the some of the work that came out of the Architectural Association uh, and their landscape urbanism program, they did really great work in showing how geometries um, uh, like fractals, like uh, Voronoi uh, arrays, actually gives us really great ways to combine things like uh, agriculture and food production with cities. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I, I think it's not something that's been well developed, but there is a few projects out there. Um, there was the One North project in Singapore that was really uh, was a master plan by Zaha Hadid. And it, it took very non-traditional geometries and a three-dimensional kind of mega form and split that up in a fractal way. Um, and there's other work that's been done by uh, other officers that have done similar things, but it's not, it's not the predominant way. Uh, it's starting to happen, 
uh, in limited circumstances, but it is a way that we can actually look at a different way of doing things. So I think for sure it's something that, that gives us answers sometimes. Okay. Um, so far, this is the question that we had. Uh, if anyone have questions, we still have about four minutes. So. Okay, how do you think about the computing thing with the analysis and data that we you mentioned earlier? Uh, mm. Do you think that will be really an important role in the future about the AI usage and the architecture offices and et cetera, plenty of that, how it's generated and designed and analyzed, et cetera? Yeah, look, I think it, whether we like it or not, um, computation is going to be at the core of what we do moving forward. Mm. Um, but it also gives us massively powerful tools. Uh, yeah. And so the, the early projects that we did simply by extracting publicly available information from Google Earth and turning that into a sort of planning framework that was sort of ground up um, shows that and you know we're going back five uh, five ten years now in terms of those things um it just shows you that with the, the way that that technology will uh, continue to emerge that that's going to give us some incredible uh, tools at our disposal um we are already seeing some of the convergence and in the last three months we've seen things like rhino and revit um, you can now use rhino and grasshopper inside of revit um, there is tools like speckle uh, which started off as a um, as a grasshopper script um, that is now uh, allowing you to use grasshopper within other programs or in a web interface. The, people are starting to actually uh, see the way that um, getting things to interoperate will actually work better for everyone. And even companies like Autodesk are starting to move away from a model of we do everything you have to you're locked in you have to use our tools to actually supporting the idea of using other tools um so i think it's a really interesting time and things are changing really rapidly okay this is the question from i think his name is soda uh, the question is how do we try to introduce and actively practice sustainable design in developing countries like india Excellent question, um, and it's this, it's actually the same challenge that we have in the Gulf uh, or any other place. I've even found the same problems when I was practicing in Singapore. Um, the uh, the the way that most people respond to you talking about sustainability is well, that's expensive, um, and it really doesn't need to be. We have to actually stop thinking about sustainability as an applied layer. And you have to actually build it up from uh, from the beginnings Gosh. of a project. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, I'll give one example of uh, a project we were recently working on in the kingdom. Uh, we were working for a developer. It was a very, very large project site, 60 square kilometers, um, very low density, uh, residential farms, basically. Um, and so uh, they had planned a conventional uh, 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 infrastructure network mainly we, we started looking at it and seeing that there was uh, hundreds of kilometers of pipeline for a sewage network that was very small and it wasn't connected to the overall network so you still had to treat it all on site so what we did was actually propose uh, a, na a nature-based system reed beds that are native to the region um, and distributed those uh, throughout uh, the, the project on project sites um, all the treatment happens underground. It's not, it, it, there's no, uh, there's no smells or anything like that that come from the system and it's part of a natural wadi ecosystem. So it sort of belongs in, in the place. Um, we ended up uh, calculating the potential savings of 400 million reals um, by using a nature-based decentralized system. Um, and, and have had similar sort of examples in other places in the Gulf where, again, um, if you think carefully at the outset of the project, um, you can come up with systems that not not just they're, they're less expensive or they're not they're, they're the same cost, but they'll save significant amounts of money. 
Um, and as a, as a profession, we're used to pulling things apart. You think about uh, potable water this way, you think about wastewater that way, you think about energy that way. But if you actually join these things, if you actually think about one system as a solution to all of those things, you get to the point where you can save significant amounts of money. And I think that that is a change, that's a turning point we're getting to, but it's really hard work to convince people to do that, especially when it's something that hasn't been done before in the region, because that's mm. the other question you'll get when it's not about money. It's about, well, where has it been done before? And if you can't yeah. say it's been done in the region, it's really hard to convince people. Okay, there is last question. How do you incorporate, this is from Abhi, how do you incorporate the local values in your designs? Since, sorry, the local know, buyers? Local values, sorry. Oh, values. Local okay. values, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, look, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and it's something that, that um, I, I've i always sort of had, had a bit of a passion for. My, my, my postgraduate studies were in heritage conservation and, and planning. And uh, I think that one, one thing that always stuck with me from that is that there's, there's sort of two main issues around uh, cultural heritage or, or heritage. Yeah. One is cultural heritage and the, the, the heritage that we make. Um, and then there's natural heritage and the sort of the, the natural systems that have actually um, have great cultural value as well. Um, so I think the way that we look at things when we're talking about projects is the same. And we're currently doing a competition for uh, a part of uh, the kingdom. It's tourism focused. And, and a huge part of it is, is cultural heritage based. Um, and you need to actually talk to people. You need to actually talk to the people that are there. What actually interests them? What do they want for their own futures? Because if you don't actually address what people want um, uh, and their values, um, you, you sort of, you impose something on them and that, that rarely works well uh, across time since sort of uh, modernism sort of came about. We sort of applied a generic response to things and that never really worked. I think we've, we've got to embody values uh, in everything we do um, and that can be uh, in the way that in certain regions, farming has been in decline uh, and you know you need to give people a way to maintain their farming traditions um, because you know uh, it's not economical but no it's it's really important in cultural heritage terms um, it, it's different for every project you really have to look at the specificity of each site uh, look at its natural systems and its uh, its cultural systems and try and find a way I think a key thing that we try and do is keep master plans open. Um, master planning is always so much about here's a fixed product, here's the renders, this is what it'll look like when it's finished. Um, and we try to leave flexibility in most of what we do and look at just starting some programs, these catalysts. Um, and that can be something like, you know, um, in an area where farms are being abandoned and young people are moving to cities, um, it can be, you know, a farmer service centre that treats people, teaches people how to make viable, uh, sort of long-term viable businesses uh, out of uh, their uh, their former farming land. Um, and if you don't do those sorts of things, you actually lose the cultural heritage. So I think there, there's sort of ways and means that you have to indirectly encourage uh, cultural heritage in a community, by the community, um, and not concrete things that you have to plan for mm. in the master plan. Okay, uh, we finished all the questions so far. We, we had to go with a few uh, because the time is over. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Stephen. Uh, it was a very impressive talk and the presentation is really valuable. Uh, thank you everyone who attended and uh, thank you again for being with us tonight. Thank you all. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.